Do it. Why American history? Why watch radical figures by second thought? Let's go. Curiosity stream. Get free access to Nebula, the ad-free creator-controlled streaming service, when you sign up for Curiosity Stream at the link below. I'm Jamaica, and a lot of them wish they stayed with the British Empire. It's hard to function with a tiny island nation. Yeah. The problem is when they leave. When when the the uh, when the imperial forces are gone. They leave the country in a worse off position than it already was. When it was in a worse opposition than it already is. Hi. Um, there's a lot of uh in that in the, that kind of um that kind of removal of a of a colonial power or uh, imperial power creates a power vacuum where really, really fucking corrupt people that are oftentimes literally sympathizers or loyalists to the fucking uh, colony itself. Or is the, to the colonial power itself will then turn around and, and take advantage of that destabilization. Decolonization leaves them without proper infrastructure and good governance. The least previous empire states can do is build them up. It's really sad. But they don't even fucking do that. That's the point. Or when they do, they do it through exactly the process that I just mentioned, which is like enforcing, uh, uh, con like only giving them conditional loans and controlling their rebuilding process in a way that still continues to benefit uh, those very same nations that left them in this, uh, in this horrible, uh, horrible condition to begin with. What do Thomas Paine, Rosa Parks, Albert Einstein, Helen Keller, John Steinbeck, George Orwell, Pablo Picasso... Nelson They're all socialists. Sorry, I had to say it. Nelson Mandela, Bertrand Russell, and Martin Luther King Jr. all have in common. They're all democratic. These socialists. historical figures, among many others, are routinely taught about in American schools. They're all praised for their various contributions, hey, whether Daniel. artistic, societal, government... They're all socialists, and they never fucking mention that in any... You just, for the first time, fucking found that out just in this video. A lot of you... For the first time, just fucking found that out. Yes, Einstein was as well. ...or scientific, and they're all generally portrayed as good, virtuous, and intelligent people. But they also have one more thing in common. Something that's never mentioned in American schools. They were all socialists. In yep. this episode, we're going to take a brief look at how history, especially American history, tends to whitewash radical figures, and why it's done. This video could easily be an hour long, but since I have analytics that show me just how long the average person watches, I'm going to try to keep this short. With that in mind, we're only going to look at a couple of the many historical figures who have had their radical past defanged by imperialist history. Let's start way back in the earliest days of the United States. These days, it can be pretty hard to find anything to like about modern politicians in the US, with many Americans complaining that, in decades past, those who ran for office possessed integrity and unimpeachable morals that current candidates lack. The further back most people look, the more wistful they seem to become. When are you going to stop pretending you haven't watched these videos? <laughs> I love that. <clears throat> it's a very nice compliment. It is a very nice compliment. So thank you. As I briefly discussed in my episode on the Electoral College, Americans tend to treat the Founding Fathers especially as these almost mythical figures who had their best interests at heart and that could do no wrong. In reality, they were people just like the rest of us. And people, then and now, aren't perfect. Some of you may be aware and appalled that, for example, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, among others, owned slaves, and believed in the superiority of the European white man. Other Americans might not care about these flaws and just brush off those beliefs as a sign of the times. But not everyone who helped shape the country had such disappointing values, values that are contemptible in the modern era. If you do a little digging, one of the Founding Fathers in particular stood above the rest, dramatically ahead of his time, a champion of real Adams? equality as well as American independence, Thomas Paine. Oh, From Thomas the days Paine. of his youth in England, Thomas Paine had been dedicated to improving the lives of average people and the poor. He volunteered at his church to collect money to distribute to the needy, he was once fired from his job as a tax collector after advocating for better pay and striking over the matter. After he made his way to the American colonies in 1774, Paine found a position as editor of the Pennsylvania Magazine, where he advocated for the abolition of slavery almost a full century before the practice was actually banned in the US. You may be thinking, wait a minute, could Thomas Paine really have been a socialist all the way back in the 1770s? That's a fair question. As many Glad people I consider the beginning of socialism man. as a distinct ideology to be so sometime around the French Revolution of 1789, 
While he may not have had the terminology we associate with socialism today, Paine checked all the boxes, so we could technically call him a proto-socialist, in that he followed a set of values that had not necessarily been fully codified. Paine was deeply concerned for the world's poor, he was staunchly against the British rule of the American colonies, and he dedicated his life to fostering a revolutionary spirit among his readers. First in the colonies, and then- His take on Washington was literally horrendous. Washington's ideas were far beyond his time, and not to mention he treated his slaves extremely fairly and freed many of them. No, he didn't. You're literally wrong. You're completely incorrect. And it's fine. You've, at least you admit that fucking Washington owned slaves. Some people don't. First of all, there is no such thing as like treating your slaves fairly. Okay. The only person who treats their slaves fairly is the person who immediately frees them. <clears throat> if those slaves are given to them, you know, in the process of like a, a parent dying or some shit. Okay. That's one. Two, George Washington did not treat his slaves fairly. Even if there was such a thing as treating slaves fairly, like not raping them uh, in the same way that Jefferson did, for example. Um, he knew very well that slavery was immoral. Not only did he know that slavery was immoral, he absolutely took advantage of loopholes to ensure that he never had to free his slaves. He would take advantage of a loophole where he would move his, his slaves from, uh, I think, Pennsylvania. He would move his slaves across state lines every six months Can't to ensure that they, were never, they never had to be freed because there was a law back then where you could only have slaves for six months, uh, where George Washington was. So, no, he knew it was bad, and yes, he kept doing it, and he absolutely did not treat his slaves fairly. Such a concept does not even exist, by the way. So, come on. There's no such thing as, like, ethical slavery. What kind of libertarian uh, mentality is this? Um, so, yeah. Well, back then, if you were freed, though, they would go back into the system, I am sure, at least having them being kind to them, provided with a safe place. No, that's not fucking... No, that's bullshit as well. Oh, the situation was worse off for them free is a ridiculous fucking take. Then abroad. His most well-known pamphlet, Common Sense, decries rulers and those who love- I don't understand how you guys are- I don't know how you guys are fucking having this take. Like, it is just nuts. Every conversation that we have around the ethics of slavery, unfortunately, oftentimes revolves around whether the founding fathers thought it was good or bad and it literally overlooks the slaves themselves. We, whenever we try to have a, a conversation about slavery, literally do not think of the slaves as human beings. If you ask the fucking slaves, I don't think they would be like, this is actually pretty good or this is actually pretty bad. They would not want to be slaves. The enslaved people's man okay really like that's the that's the fucking corrective behavior that you want to engage in uh in this conversation like do you think i'm on fucking i'm on oh yikes dude lust for power saying men who look upon themselves born to reign and others to obey soon grow insolent Selected from the rest of mankind, their minds are early poisoned by importance, and the world they act in differs so materially from the world at large that they have but little opportunity of knowing its true interests, and when they succeed to the government, are frequently the most ignorant and unfit of any throughout the dominions. Once the Revolutionary War was over and the Founding Fathers had settled into positions of power, Paine was expelled from government and labeled unpatriotic for rightly accusing a fellow diplomat of war profiteering. Not content with having freed just one nation from hereditary rule, Paine was determined to do the same thing in France during their own revolution. From his home in London, and against the will of both the British and French governments, Paine Asshole. published the rights- I don't comment much, but to be the devil's advocate from last day, slave life is all they know, how could they want anything else? Do you guys think that, like, the abolition movement started on its own or something? Like, do you think that it was a white man, a white man's burden, where a white man finally said, let's free these slaves, is that how it works? If slaves, if enslaved peoples, uh, if all they knew was being a slave, a lifetime of, of subjugation to slavery, then why the fuck did you need slave drivers? 
Why did you need to whip them? Oh, it turns out people don't want to fucking do that. Okay? People don't want to fucking do this shit. There's no devil's advocate in this, in this situation. That's literally how it happened. White men decided to free them. What? Can you tell me why you're trying to cultivate a political religion? Bro. Yo, dude. Yo, dude. You gotta, you gotta clap that. Like, you gotta, I, I got, I can't even. That, it's such a fucking brain disease that I, I don't know how to describe. I don't know how to fucking uh, respond to that. Like. Like, white people played a fundamental role in the abolition of slavery. But this notion that, like, it was the white man who fucking decided it's time now is ridiculous. And just like slavery is all they know as a justification for, uh, for what uh, uh, black people wanted back then, is again talking over the opinions of, of uh, those people and, and dehumanizing them and looking at them as a product to consume rather than actual fully fledged human beings. You would literally never ever in a million years talk about anyone or anything else in the same way. You would never use this language. You would never just say that. Oh, well, what about fucking sex slaves? Like, that's all they know. All they know is being trafficked. Like, that's all their life is. Would you ever, ever fucking behave that way? Absolutely not. You would never say that. It's of man, which demanded the universal acknowledgement of inalienable rights to the entire like population and proposed Thanks. systems to allow for these rights to flourish. Those systems- I'm black, I love you, but it's wild that I'm learning more from watching you about my own history in my public school. Yeah, well, that's on purpose. Included universal welfare, child I'm play care, with HGC education, in a and pension. bit. I'm, I'm still eating. Years later, having burned all his bridges with the leadership of Britain, France, and the U.S., Payne died penniless and alone in New York. Only six people attended his funeral. Today, a plaque commemorates the site in New York, reading in part, "The world is my country. All mankind are my brethren. To do good is my religion." Thomas Paine was not only more progressive than those of his time, he was more progressive than even many Americans today. Paine opposed the concept of private ownership of land, and admired the Iroquois nation for living sustainably and democratically. He supported universal suffrage, the right of workers to control the capital they used, and was the first notable American to propose the implementation of UBI. Taken together, all of this essentially makes him the original American socialist, and people like Bernie Sanders follow in his centuries-old footsteps. Compare this information with what you learned about Paine in school. You probably knew he wrote Common Sense, which supported the colonial struggle against the British crown. Odds are, that's all you were taught. But let's fast forward to a more recent radical figure. Martin Luther King Jr. was, and remains to this day, the most well-known figure of the civil rights era. From 1955 until his assassination in 1968, MLK fought for desegregation, labor rights, the right for black Americans to vote, and countless other societal reforms that today we take for granted. Hansa, Just about uh, every Hansa, American uh, Hansa, is familiar uh, with at least some of King's story. We are taught that he was a good Christian man who advocated for equal rights and that he led a march on Washington and gave the I Have a Dream speech. This of course ended racism and everyone lived happily ever after the end. <laughs> Obviously, that's not the case, but that's about the extent of the American education on the civil rights era. Here's the thing, Dr. King was a far more radical organizer than most people today are aware. American history books tend not to include King's later activism. He was staunchly anti-imperialist, harshly criticizing America's meddling in foreign affairs, especially in Vietnam. He was opposed to militarism and war. He rightly pointed out that poverty could be eliminated with the tools at our disposal. It was simply a matter of putting... Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure, I'm just trying to scan. Whenever they see Vietnam, sometimes they'll show. American history is so gruesome and so violent that, like, Twitch will literally not let me show you the outcome of American uh, history, oftentimes. So I'm, I'm just scanning through. Like, the, my first ban ever was around this exact same subject. Do you think MLK is not a doctor because he's actually a reverend doctor? Yes, he's a reverend. I'm pretty sure, I, I would doubt, I doubt that MLK was like, you need to call me a doctor. The, I, I don't know why people, God, I don't want to get stunlocked on this again. I don't know why you guys like brush over the, 
literal argument that I'm making, which is pretentious as fuck, to like constantly correct people to be like, I'm a doctor, by the way. Um, or even in the same way that like Jill Biden low key or the Joe Biden campaign low key did, like take advantage of her doctorate in education to make it seem like she's a fucking medical doctor, which even confused people like Whoopi Gold uh Whoopi Goldberg. Um God. A lot of you got a PhD in fucking baiting, I think. Human life over corporate profits. When he led the Montgomery bus boycott at just 26 years old, King was already devoted to the struggle for equal rights. But, like anyone, his opinions evolved over time. As he led marches and spoke with people from all walks of life, he began to realize that the problems black people faced in America were a symptom of a larger disease. Between 1957 and 1968, King traveled over 6 million miles, delivered more than 2,500 speeches, and was arrested and thrown in jail at least 20 times. Over that period, Dr. King developed an understanding of the way poverty, racism, militarism, and imperialism were all tangled up together in the mess we know as capitalism. He said, call it democracy or call it democratic socialism, but there must be a better distribution of wealth within this country for all God's children. Martin Luther King wasn't shy about making his political beliefs known. It's just that modern histories like to leave that part out to make King more palatable. To make him seem like a harmless do-gooder. Bro, the shit MLK said about Ho Chi Minh, which was absolutely correct, by the way. But the stuff he said about Ho Chi Minh. If you want to troll neoliberals on the internet who, like, get off on talking about how much they love being the white savior of, like, third world... Uh, countries or whatever just literally quote um the good reverence uh takes on ho chi Minh, okay uncle ho as though they are your own and watch them fucking tell you that you are a tanky larper racist class reductionist okay because 16 like, months bugger. he was absolutely correct at the time for for what he said but but like the, our understanding of MLK is that, you know, he's a good guy and that's because he was very civil and very nonviolent and he never said stuff that offended white people's sensibilities. Okay? Here, where is it? He, he... It was a famous speech called Beyond Vietnam, okay? Exactly one year before his assassination, I think this is the one I'm thinking of. That speech entitled Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break the Silence was an unequivocal denunciation of America's involvement in Southeast Asian conflict. A time comes when silence is betrayal. King told the crowd gathered the Riverside Baptist Church in New York. He indicated that his commitment to nonviolence left him little choice. I knew that I never again would raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in, in the world, my own government. He given an anti-war speech uh, in February 1967, but that sentiment was often described as pro-communist in America that is in the midst of the Cold War. So King spoke again two months later to ensure his position was clear. King carefully laid out the history of the nation's involvement in Vietnam. He started in 1945. When Vietnam's Prime Minister Ho Chi Minh overthrew the Japanese and French, he carried his audience through American support for France's effort to regain his former colony. The only change from America as we increased our troop commitments in support of the governments, which were singularly corrupt, inept, and without popular support. Now they languish under our bombs and consider us, not their fellow Vietnamese, the real enemy. Okay, this is not showing some of the more radical parts. I'm not going to make you watch the, it's a 56 minute speech or it's a long ass speech. Look at what Chunk Yogurt said. MLK also beat his wife, but he's still praised by white guilt SJWs. Um, classic. I mean, when you're racist and, and you have nothing else, you're like, oh, well he, he beat his wife. It's ironic because normally that kind of uh, behavior is something that, you know, if it's one of your figures that you would appreciate. Um, <clears throat> that's something that you would criticize the SJWs over. Like when, when some people were saying, uh, 
that Frederick Douglass left his black wife and and went and married a white woman. And therefore, like, his accomplishments are, uh, I think, diminished, or rather, that uh, he should be uh, criticized for it. Like, it's just... It's just a, it's just a way that like, that's a bad take overall, right? It's just a way to fucking try to launch criticisms at someone. And sometimes when progressive people do it, I shit on them. When Republicans do it though, or when conservatives do it, they literally do it because they just can't openly say it because he's a pussy and he can't say like Martin Luther, you can't call Martin Luther King the N word, right? Cause he's too big of a pussy. He has to turn around and be like, oh, he beat his wife. Or some shit. Yeah. Gotta attack the character. Yeah. People that own slaves. Good. Um, profoundly important figures. Oh, by the way, uh, the, the beat his wife thing is, uh, beat his wife thing with MLK is like, um, I don't know how, I mean, I think he was regarded as, as, uh, a bit of a misogynist, but, but, um, most of that shit is FBI, uh, propaganda, including the fact that they, uh, tried to blackmail him. It's definitely, I, I don't know. I don't think he, I don't think he was, uh, I don't think he ever like beat his wife or anything. I, I'm not, I'm uncertain though, but I might be, he cheated on or not beat her. No, the FBI, the womanizer thing is not a CIA psyop or FBI. The, the part of it is the part of the part of this combo that is like completely made up is the part of this conversation that was completely fucking made up is is the stuff that he was like doing uh he was engaging in like sexual activities that at the time would be deemed degenerate and that was all fucking blackmail from the FBI it was made up and by the way none of that matters like literally none of that matters it doesn't matter. I don't give a fuck that he cheated on his wife. I'm sorry. Like, sorry. Like, I, I don't care. I, I literally don't care. Yeah, FBI did send him a uh, blackmail letter saying who now celebrate him by the way who celebrate him on you know on on his day of remembrance but uh concerning black women and the way that civil rights affect us we have to realize that some of these figures do work entirely for our liberation so although we are thankful for what progress we had is just a conscious punch a continuous punch in the gut the progressive movements continue to neglect us i just you're right. And oftentimes history does overlook the contributions of black women specifically, right? Uh, as, it, uh, as it highlights the efforts that black men have had. However, having said that, they were just Thanks fucking misogynistic. Your life. Much appreciated. They are, to a certain degree, a product of their own... Um, like, it's not a good thing, right? I'm not saying it's a good thing. But they are a product of their of their upbringing. Who just wanted black people to be able to vote and drink from the same water fountains as white people. That's not who Dr. King was. He preached a message of love and equality, but he was outspoken about the problems plaguing America. He called the U.S. the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, a claim which has only become more and more obviously true over the decades. He condemned the nation's military action against Vietnam, saying, The bombs in Vietnam explode at home. They destroy the hopes and possibilities for a decent America. This was absolutely true. The money we spent on that pointless, destructive war could have been far better spent at home, improving the lives of everyday Americans of all races, because, as King noted, Negroes are not the, the only poor in the, the nation. There are nearly twice as many white poor as Negro. And therefore, the struggle against poverty is not involved solely with color or racial discrimination, but with- Wow, what a class reductionist, dude! Wow. MLK is such a class reductionist, dude. He's even using the N-word. Not a good look, sweaty. I'm a white guy who's a neoliberal and has a globe uh, emoji on his Twitter account, by the way. So, I know better.
with elementary economic justice. Dr. King Class reduction is tanky. King would continue to speak on behalf of the poor, downtrodden, and forgotten, and not just those Sorry. in America, but around the world, until the end of his life. In 1968, the year of his death, King said in an interview, for years I labored with the idea of reforming the existing institutions of society. A little change here, a little change there. Now I feel quite differently. I think you've got to have a reconstruction of the entire society, a revolution of values. He knew that milquetoast reforms and compromise would never be sufficient to save the country, and that radical change was needed. Because of this, while traveling to support striking sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee, Dr. King was murdered. At the time of his death, he had just a 30% approval rating among Americans. This is in stark contrast with the rosy picture of an American hero we're shown in school. We're taught that most Americans respected MLK, and that he changed their minds. Clearly- <laughs> uh, no. Clearly, our education system is a little lacking in the accuracy department. Today, about 94% of Americans say they have a positive opinion of Dr. King. Has something in the hearts and minds of the American people changed over the years? I don't think so. I believe that the way our history is presented is intentionally misleading. It defangs our most radical figures and presents them as whitewashed icons of a generally accepted movement. Women's suffrage, civil rights, labor laws. Any time there has been a major popular uprising in this country, our history books have picked a face to be a convenient representative, a sort of moral arbiter we can project our good feelings onto, while allowing the general population to ignore the actual mass movements that supported and carried these noble figures. It's an intentional attempt- They used to call him a communist agitator, uh, causing riots all around the country. So, you know, everything that you hear about Black Lives Matter right now, and the legitimate grievances that Black Lives Matter protesters have, those exact same fucking arguments were launched against Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. Nearly identical. Communists, they're trained Marxists, they're, they're agitators, they fucking hate this country, they're doing riots, they're uppity, they should know their place, come on, it's separate but equal. All of it. And by the way, he had fucking choice words for the white moderate as well, who said, I'm going to put a fucking time on, on your liberation. It wasn't just... It was not just like the, the fucking conservatives of the races that Martin Luther King had words for. Okay. He also had choice words for the liberals who said, oh, I really like what you're, I really like the idea behind your movement, but like, I just don't like the way you're saying it. Attempt to make people believe that a single person with a nice idea is all it takes to bring about real you know, and lasting Focusing change. on optics, focusing on... Focusing on the optics of the movement, that sort of thing. The ironic thing is, each of the people portrayed in this way recognized and publicly acknowledged that a single person has no real power, and that a mass movement is necessary in order to force positive change. Those in power will never give up that power without a fight. We need to realize that when we're presented with an accounting of history that does not engage with all the facts, we're being subtly conditioned to constrain the scope of our worldview and our politics. Rosa Parks was a brave woman who sat where she wanted to sit. Martin Luther King was a preacher who wanted equal rights. Albert Einstein was just a really smart scientist. Picasso was just an artist. Orwell and Steinbeck were just authors. All of these people and many more have been stripped of their radical beliefs to make them acceptable for an American I don't capitalist know how the fuck you read Orwell. Why engage with the actual I don't know how the fuck you read Orwell and then not recognize that he's, he's a lefty. Convictions these people held when we can just rewrite their lives to make them harmless figureheads that stand for something entirely- Or not Orwell, sorry. Uh, fucking, I was thinking of a Steinbeck more than Orwell. Sorry. Um, the, the, the Orwell one is, is interesting as well, but, like, Steinbeck is, is especially- George Orwell was a, um, I think George Orwell was still anti-USSR though. George Orwell was a, a democratic socialist, but he, he was not, uh, too fond of, uh, the USSR. He hated fascists, but
which is oftentimes used against them now. Like, if they only fucking knew... If they, if he only fuck, like, the, what, his, his, uh, position against, his position against, uh, like, totalitarian governments, or his position against the USSR, he literally fought in a war for a true leftist, uh, has allowed so many, uh, capitalists to co-opt, uh, that as though he is, like, anti- as though he's not anti-capitalist. <sighs> Orwell's a snitch. He literally out of communist of the British government. Look up Orwell's list. Yeah, uh, lefties fucking uh, go in and out of liking Orwell. There's a, there's a bunch of people that won't like him. But yeah, he is, he's a, a bit of an anarchy kitty who actually, he wasn't a, he wasn't like a fucking centrist though. That's what I'm trying to say. He was not a fucking centrist. He was definitely anti-capitalist and this notion that he was like, a pro-capitalist, anti-communist person is psychotic. It's literally anti-fascist or anti-totalitarian or anti-authoritarian. Um, uh, a person who himself, if I'm not mistaken, uh, who, who took up arms to fight against a, a fascist regime is, is not, is being remembered as like a fucking pro-capitalist. Really different today than what they stood for in life. The people who use Martin Luther King as an example of a quote, good black protester are choosing to engage with a version of history that does not exist. A version that has been molded to make white people not feel bad about the civil rights era. Those people need to reckon with the fact that they would have been in the 60% that held an unfavorable opinion of Dr. King in 1968. Why? Because if he were alive today, his convictions would put him on the front lines of every divisive issue that so many of these Americans take as an attack on their traditional values and the greatness of our nation. Anti-war, anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, and a radical love for the people our predatory system has cast aside. That's why our histories whitewash radical figures, so the mass movements they represented won't inspire the next generation. So we'll feel like we could never measure up to these seemingly lone actors who affected all that change all by themselves. They weren't by themselves. They had a whole lot of normal people standing with them in solidarity. And those people don't get a page in the history books. If you'd like to learn more about any of the figures I mentioned in this video, I've left some links in the description. For Dr. King in particular, I highly recommend you check out Martin Luther King Jr. on CuriosityStream. It's a great short watch about Dr. King's contributions to the civil rights movement. Curiosity Stream is an established streaming platform with a solid track record of caring about great educational content. Great video. Hi, guy.